Well, hello again and welcome to Horizon Scan. Um, today we're talking about, well, how to get the best out of cloud and infrastructure and uh, I guess the decisions we make about uh, those two things. And today we have with us Elcio from LeaseWeb uh, and Peter from Flexion MSP. So I suppose we're thinking about this, guys, you know, I often think it, you know, deploying cloud infrastructure is now mainstream and uh, often appears very straightforward. But I wonder if it really is that straightforward. Um, so Peter, perhaps maybe to get us started, you know, you've always been very agnostic about different providers. You know, what's your top down view about this? It seems to me that the, with the, so much change that there is going on uh, right now, we have to be really careful decisions we make because um, you can't chop and change all the time. And a, a decision that you're putting in place for your, uh, your business, be it infrastructure or whatever, is going to have a long, long implications. And, and if we're seeing lots of change like we are at the moment, we just need to think about that really quite carefully. And I, I see several things driving decision making right now and they are different from the past um I, I think confidence in cloud infrastructure is improving um without question uh, online services are just penetrating everywhere we're all we're all depending on them so much more and that 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 increases requirement um and increases the need for resilience and support and all those sorts of things uh, is this I know you're you're hot on uh, performance and cost. Uh, what what what's your view about this? Yeah, I, I very much agree with this. Um, I think the most important requirement you should nowadays have, if you if you choose a, a cloud provider, is not so much that you choose the right uh, the right one, but mainly that you choose a technology and an and an and a business approach that makes it possible to change if you need to, so that flexibility is becoming more and more important exactly uh, because of to create more resilience um, and to also not give a login in uh, in in a, in a certain uh, uh, supplier um, like you said um, uh, cost and performance is, is at least for our customers normally the, the driving factor uh, and, and and what I also see is that let's say uh, about six seven years ago uh, it was sort of an, uh, a hyperscaler only uh, approach and at the moment we see a lot of customers reconsidering their hyperscaler only uh, strategy and uh, we see that more and more customers start to look at cost or uh, uh, performance or servers or something like that and therefore they might uh, uh, move to uh, parts of their infrastructure, not all of their infrastructure, to other providers. So what we see is more and more that the customers implement a hybrid cloud strategy and not so much a cloud only uh, or one cloud provider only strategy. One of the things I've noticed uh, is that the, the tech stack uh, is becoming more complex. You know, there was a time when it was compute or it was store or it was something else and, and you just pushed the whole now it's much more graduated than that and technical workloads are, are starting to become more polarized and with with heavy requirements over here maybe it's for i don't know um machine learning or something like that which requires a completely different kind of, of workload and therefore infrastructure from say um web interaction or driving a uh, an app uh, which may be more about throughput and and because of the the diversity of technical load that requires you to have a diversity of, of infrastructure that that's one change that's happening uh, another change i think is that there are so many more options available there's lots of people with, particularly with niche services uh coming uh coming in and and this the, there's a match between these niche services which are really good really good at doing certain things and the the requirement for services that are really good at doing these particular things and and 
to go with one provider would seem to be to deny yourself all the opportunities of those newly emerging services all the time. Very much agree. And uh, if you set up your services in such a way that you are flexible to move, then you can also start using all new kinds of technologies that today you're not even aware of. But uh, let's say that tomorrow a, a new technology starts somewhere for machine learning and you're interested in machine learning or your, your application needs machine learning, then it's very good to have it set up in such a way that you can move parts of your infra infrastructure easily to another provider. So that's really important when you start to host a certain application there is the possibility to move parts to others or maybe the whole application or at least you have the flexibility to do it. But the, the, the hyperscale, they've all got their machine learning options, the, you know, the range of services uh, in Azure, Google, uh, AWS, there, there are a huge range of services. Of course, they're not all the same, but they're, they're, they're one way or another they're addressing similar issues why why wouldn't you just use whatever your hyperscaler of choice uh, has got um several several reasons um but even if you would do that then you might like uh, the uh, certain uh, applications or certain services i should call it mm -hmm. from one hyperscaler than from the other so even if you only use hyperscalers there's already uh, in my opinion a good reason to, to make your application ready to use several hyperscalers. So you mean you might have part of your load on AWS, but use some spot services from Google, let's say? For example, yes. Yeah. And we, we know customers who are doing that. Um, but you might also uh, see that uh, you need a more um, uh, a reliable or predictable, I should say, a more predictable invoice and that is something which is really hard to get with the hyperscalers, or uh, you might need more performance than you can get uh, at your current provider. Uh, but those are good reasons to find another provider, um, maybe a more niche provider, uh, who can really help you with that specific need. I'm in, intrigued by what you say about uh, invoicing. Are you seeing something your customers seeing something about invoicing that how do you go about invoicing your customers that is different yeah well what, what we see a lot is that um, uh, customers go to one of the hyperscalers where everything is on page you go it you think that you're really flexible you know you can easily up, upgrade and down uh, downgrade however uh, the disadvantage is that it's really hard to predict the uh, the cost but at the end of the month so what we see is that quite some customers want to have a more predictable uh, invoice and the other thing is that if you have everything on pay as you go uh, it's normally a lot more cost effective um, to get uh, at least a monthly commit or maybe a yearly commit and that will push the cost down, which is not always possible uh, at your current provider or might not be possible at your current provider. Um, so what we do a lot, we really look at the total load of, of our customers, then we define their, their base load. The base load normally you can easily commit on 12 months or maybe even longer. And then uh, for peak load, you go to one of the providers who can offer a proper pay go service. Um, and that way you can normally save quite some cost. Okay, I, I, I think I'm starting to see. So where would you say the hyperscalers are uniquely good? Because it seems to me that some of the things they do are kind of like anybody could do. And some of the things they could do that they do are probably only best done by them. Could, could we separate that list out? What are the what are the me too things they do and what are the me only things they do? Yeah, that, that, that depends a bit on, on, on the hyperscaler, but in general, I would say um, they have some, uh, some really good, very specific pass functionality. 
Um, but if you look at EAS functionality, so infrastructure as a service and PaaS stands for platform as a service. Uh, uh, the PaaS functionality, I would say, is, is normally on a quite high level and, and very feature rich with the hyperscalers. But if you mainly rely on infrastructure as a service, then it's relatively easy to look broader than only the hyperscalers and um, uh, to get a more cost effective solution uh, somewhere else, which in many cases can also mean that you get more performance for the same or even less money. So we're talking then, I think what I'm hearing is predictability um, in, in some parts where you need it and, yeah. and variability where you have to have it. Um, uh, I think I'm, I'm also hearing uh, activity as being one of the things, dynamic activity as being one of the things that they do well. Um, and and uh, are they are they all pretty much the same? I guess what I'm trying to ask is whether the hyperscalers are over here, and here are the things they do, and everybody else is here. Or is actually more nuanced than that. It must be more nuanced than that, surely. It is. It is because to me it's, it's <laughs> harder and harder to really tell who, who exactly the hyperscalers are. You know, the hyperscalers for sure are uh, Google, uh, AWS. Uh, Azure and I think Alibaba Cloud should be added nowadays as well. But you also have a lot of other uh, uh, providers who, who start to become sort of hyperscalers. So it's, it is a bit of a, a messy word. It becomes a bit of a messy word. Um, having said that, you yeah you still have providers um, uh, who can really offer uh, uh, niche. Uh, pass functionality or niche EAS functionality where your application might benefit very well. Yeah. And and what are what are some of the some of the drivers that have brought customers your way? Um, yeah for lease web uh, the main drivers are uh, predictability of the cost and uh, lowering the cost and uh, we've, we've seen cases where we can really save 20 to sometimes even I even know a case where we, where we could do save more than 40 percent of the monthly uh, cost uh, by moving parts of the infrastructure from one of the hyperscalers uh, to towards leaseware so cost is definitely a, a, a very important driver but we also know quite a few cases where we were able to offer a lot more performance for the same or maybe a slightly lower uh, invoice, monthly invoice, um, by moving parts of the infrastructure to dedicated servers. And that is something we do quite a lot. And to do that, normally you really need um, uh, good connections towards the hyperscalers, which we can offer nowadays. And, and, uh are you seeing situations where uh, customers would like to move but can't? Because that, to me, that that would be the that would be the world world to be in. One where you know you shouldn't be where you are, but you can't move to where you want to be. Uh, specifically, if customers have a lot of uh, data stored uh, at uh, at another provider, some providers charge you nothing to bring in the data but they do charge really high amounts to get it out so that is something you really need to be careful with because otherwise you might have a lock-in because you can never get your data out of your provider and that is something these will, uh, will never do yeah uh, we're obviously in the support business and um we see customers struggling to get uh, support that's timely, uh, first off, but is also cost effective. Um, and <clears throat> uh, I, I guess this, to some extent, this is the small company dealing with a big provider problem. Uh, with all really big providers, they've got a very carefully uh, graduated uh, level of support. Um, you, it's really hard to get uh, attention uh, unless you're in the group they want to talk to. Um, and, and 
how, how does that work in, in your world? Do you, are, you seeing, uh, are you seeing people struggling with, with support? I mean, do you, do you find, for example, that you, you need to give a lot of support to some of the customers that come to you? Uh, yeah, yes and no a bit, to be honest. Um, what we see is that Leaseweb is really focusing on specific verticals. Uh, EdTech, MarTech, FinTech, HealthTech, Gaming, uh, and MSPs. And those verticals are normally quite technical themselves. So they really use us for the infrastructure, for the high performance, for the network, those kind of reasons. Um, but the real troubleshooting for a, for a big part, they can do themselves. Um, but we also have customers who are not that technical or who don't want to do all that uh, monitoring and, and, and that kind of stuff. And for that, we work with uh, MSPs like, like Flexion. And um, for those customers, they definitely need a different kind of level of support, which they will definitely not find uh, with, with hyperscalers, where the, the main support is, is purely via tickets and, um, and, and uh, yeah, quite basic level, I would say. So in this in this world then that we're we're visualising, where there's much more nuance, where there are more particular requirements, and when those requirements are much more diverse and changing, <coughs> what, what do you think should be driving? What are, what are the key things that you think should be driving the decision maker uh, when when he's starting to think about where he puts his his technical workloads? Yeah, of course, uh, costs, performance. Um, but I think you should also really think about how important is the IT for you and, um, and how, how much does it cost you uh, uh, if you're down for a few minutes, hours or, or even longer. Uh, to me, that is really key in, in defining what kind of infrastructure you need and what kind of uh, um, services you need around it to make sure that you're never offline or you limit the amount of being offline. And, and, and I'm, I'm rather thinking that um, in this world where we're all using more online services more completely, more thoroughly uh, throughout everything, um, being offline is a real problem. Yeah, it depends a bit. Um, some services uh, don't, don't mind so much. Um, uh, or they uh, can accept easily that they're down uh, uh, during the night, for example, which makes it a lot easier to do upgrades. But there are definitely uh, most of the services uh, uh, need to be online for 24 hours. And, and <clears throat> are you seeing international implications of, uh, of the decisions now too? I, I guess I'm just thinking about data protectionism in a lot yeah, of that was the first thing that popped up in my mind as well uh, i think uh, internationally the most important thing uh, you should uh, think about is uh, is data protection uh, is your data protected under the law you want it to be a lot of providers have a uh, headquartered in uh, in the us which means there's always a backdoor for the us to to get access to certain data um, so it is important to have a look at that um, and that might be a reason to not choose one of the headquarter, US headquartered uh, uh, providers. Um, uh, but another one which might be very important in terms of international doing a business international is the latency on your network. This becomes a bit more technical. But if, you are, if it's really important for you that your services online are delivered with the lowest time loss, then you need to have a provider which is probably available in the countries where you are available. Yeah, absolutely. And where, you fo where, where your business focuses on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and latency is another one of those things where uh, it's, it's not getting any easier. Everybody needs lower and lower latency. That's just a fact of life. Um, and rate may change. Um, so, what where do you when do you think is the ideal time to be starting to talk to a decision maker about the structure of his uh, of his services and when's the best time to get involved 
be already when you uh, when you start developing your new application because then you have to make the decisions normally so quite early and what you see with a lot of uh, projects is that hosting comes somewhere at the end while uh, of the decision making but it should be uh, already uh, at the beginning because a lot of things that you have developed uh, automatically take uh, certain uh, hosting decisions uh, as, a, as a fact. If we had a CIO, an end user CIO sitting with us in this conversation and they were nodding profusely about what we were saying and then they described their reality which they acknowledged they were overly reliant on a hyperscaler, what practical advice would we give to that person that they could take away and start a process where they could become less reliant on a hyperscale. What practical advice could we give a person in that situation? I would say uh, start looking at how much pass functionality you use, how much EAS you use. Um, if there is any EAS, start looking at that part because that's normally the easiest part to move. Uh, we, should, we, should, we should ask you to, to give a little bit more flavor on those two things. How, how, how would I recognize what's one and what's the other? Um, for EAS, it's normally that you as an end user are in control of the uh, operating system and you are managing the operating system. So you just take a standard virtual machine or maybe even a dedicated machine from, from a provider. Uh, pass functionality um, is uh, where you, for example, uh, take um, uh, the database uh, uh, you, you don't manage the, the database itself anymore. You just talk to an API which uh, which handles your database. That kind of functionality makes it normally very hard to move because your application directly talks to the API of your service provider. So that's a big difference. So I would say first, if you want to uh, become more agnostic, first look at, at your EAS. Is that possible to move out? What are the implications if you do that? What kind of um, uh, latency do you need between your uh, uh, pass functionality and your EAS infrastructure? Um, so that also defines what kind of network you need towards the new provider. Um, I would definitely uh, recommend to start looking uh, at the difference between what do you really need 24 seven? So what is your base load and what is your peak load? Um, that's an important one to, to look at. Because it's very, it's very difficult to, <clears throat> you can't really have those conversations with a hyperscaler. Um, it's very difficult to, to ask for advice from a, a hyperscaler. It doesn't really exist. Uh, you have to get your advice from somewhere else. Uh, and. And if you haven't got it internally, um, then, because uh, these are strategic decisions, aren't they? They're not, they're not just- I fully agree, but this is why we work with a, a pre-sales team and the, our pre-sales guys can, can help you with it. But of course, then you're talking to a provider uh, who can also offer the services. So if you really want independent uh, advice, um, you, sh you should definitely go to a third party who can advise like selection, but yeah, um, uh, who can advise you and help you finding your route into a more agnostic situation, a more hybrid situation. So Peter, perhaps you can just help us characterize, you know, some of these um, decision making processes. Um, for a technology decision maker, um, and that includes the CEO and the board of a tech-enabled business. These things have got big implications uh, and, and they need to be considered at a business level. And the starting point for that decision-making should be, what does my business need? If one of the things you need is the ability to be flexible and in control of your destiny, then you should be selecting your approach to fit that objective. If your objective is that you just want to be with one big global brand, you want to let them deal with everything, and 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 uh, that, excuse me, using the word trumps uh, any other kind of decision making. Well, then you choose your provider on that basis. I mean, I, I 
I do some very work. much agree. Yeah, I, I do some work in in a, in a situation where uh, there's a lot of in a company where there's a lot of very sensitive, heavily regulated, delicate data. And the decision of most of the customers, because of their public service nature, is that they should be in Azure. And, and I think that's probably the right decision, um, given those business circumstances. So I would say yeah. start with the business implications, don't start with the provider. Yes, uh, I, I fully agree. Yeah. And, and you know, it may be when you've been through the decision making process actually that you're in the right place. Uh, maybe I fully agree, yeah. but then you should still be able uh, to make that decision at that time. That's why I said you have to discuss this already at the start when you start developing your apl application. Because if it means that you're only using uh, past functionality from Azure, and then you figure out that uh, your, your data protection will not allow you to host it at Azure, then you might have an, a, an extreme big issue at the end. So therefore, I think you really should think about this upfront so you don't have that lock-in and you can still make the decision which is needed for, for example, for your legal implication of where your data is. The first consideration, I think, for any business that is tech-enabled is to ask themselves one simple question. Have I got flexibility to make choices? If you haven't, is that something that matters to you? If it doesn't matter to you, fine. Uh, if it does matter to you, you better start figuring out a solution to that pretty quickly. It's the, the flexibility to make my own choices as a business or whether I'm trapped into a particular world everything else flows from that if you if you can make flexible choices to suit your own business needs then you're probably in a good place yeah. if you can't then at least you have to decide whether that's something you need to change or whether it's something you can live with the rest of it seems to me to be tactical that's why we've always thought of ourselves as being agnostic um, so yeah, guys, like I'd like to thank you. I think, you know, this is a subject we could talk about for uh, a, lo a long time. So I'd like to thank you again, Peter and Elcio, for uh, joining us again today and, uh, and, and talking about uh, this decision making process. Um, and for everyone who's watching, you know, if this is a subject of interest to you, as usual, we will put some contact details uh, at the end of this video and we would really uh, welcome you getting in touch and uh, and uh, continuing this conversation with us. So once again, Peter Nelcho, thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you again in a future video. Thanks very much. Bye.